everyone. We're here. We are here together. We are here. For another um, exciting, uh, information packed, titillating QA. There's a ton of questions. Karen, you're going to look through the social social media to see if there's uh, where people are at. Why don't you do that? Um, anything that we say is not meant to give you any cures or, and I know you guys want to know the cures, but we're not going to give you any cures today. But yep. we'll give you areas to research, check with your doctor before following any of the advice. Always. All right. Very exciting um, questions. Carolyn, you're from South Carolina. Uh, 48-year-old with dementia, what would, what would help? Is that your question? Go ahead. Well, I'll let you elaborate. Uh, yes. Um, my husband was diagnosed about a week ago with uh, slight dementia. Mm -hmm. He had an episode at work where his um, blood pressure was elevated. He couldn't taste food all day. The right side of his body was weak. Uh, he had slightly slurred speech, mm -hmm. and he has been told by his doctor for a couple of years that he has very low testosterone levels, and he suffers with IBS, that so he cannot do anything about. Nothing seems to help. And I was wondering if vitamin D3 and K2 could help possibly with the dementia, um, or could all these things be linked together um, nu through nutritional deficiency, possibly? Good question, uh, Catherine. The most important thing, because the, honestly, I don't think any of this is going to work unless he gets into ketosis hardcore. He needs to go on a ketogenic plan, exactly um, how I recommend it, a healthy version of it. He needs to do intermittent fasting. That's going to probably put the icing on the cake, no pun intended, because that's going to help the um, drop inflammation. It's going to help kick in certain genes that will help uh, his memory be revived. Um, so once he does those two things, and he does them for a period of time, uh, then you want to start adding a nutrition. One thing you want to add in is the MCT oil. Um, that's going to give him ketones. It's going to give the brain ketones directly. The brain doesn't have to build machinery. It already has machinery built in to, build, uh, to run on ketones. All you have to do is add ketones, and it'll start using the ketones. And the neurons um, love ketones, and they, they thrive on ketones. So that's going to be important. The other thing you could add is, of course, vitamin D, B1 as benfotamine, and then also um, I would recommend zinc, all very, very important. Vitamin B3 is also very important in dementia. But that's what I would do um, if I were him, or after I would you. Uh, if, if I was you, I would, that's what I would do. Thanks, Catherine. All right, Nikki, you are from Woodbridge, uh, New Jersey. Go ahead, you had a question. Hi, Dr. Berg. Hi. Oh, good. Um, yes, so I'm new to keto, and I'm very mathematical, and I'm struggling with figuring out the amount of protein I need. I watched, I think, maybe one of your latest videos, and I could see, okay, carbs are done in grams, Sandra 20 got that, but this whole protein and the percentage and the weights of it, so do you have good sources that you definitely would recommend? Maybe there's a formula or something like yeah. that? There is a formula. Um, I do have this on a video. I can't tell you where it is, but um, it's on a video. Especially I did one recently. Um, the formula is uh, 0.8 grams per kilogram of weight. So you just have to figure out you know, what you weigh, plug it in, and that's per day, not per meal. 0 0.8, between 0 0.8 kilograms and 1.2 kilograms, I'm sorry, let me just give it to you again, just so I, I get this right. 0.8 grams per kilogram of your weight. Okay, so if you um, are a certain kilogram weight, you would uh, basically divide that. So the ranges are 0.8 to 1.2 grams, okay, of actual protein. Now here's the thing: what determines that is a couple, a lot of factors. Um, it could be your age, um, your ability to digest protein. Um, how much exercise you do. If you're um, a really top athlete, you could go up to two grams of protein per kilogram of weight. <clears throat> so that's going to be like more than double. So that's what I would do. Now what does that look like in, um, for an average person? <clears throat> Excuse me, it could be anywhere between um, three to six to eight ounces of protein per meal. So that's what it looks like. And 
it's one of the things, it's the best way to do this is to just experiment and try different things. Try going lower, try to go more, see how you feel, see how your energy is, see how your, your, um, your overall physiology works because it's really hard to determine the exact amount unless you try. Everyone's so different based on a lot of different variables. That's what I would recommend. But it is a confusing topic. But I, I did do a recent video on that. Karen, what hey. do we got? Where do we have people uh, listening in from? They are uh, coming in from some different places this week. South Africa, Romania, Qatar, Bahrain, New York City. Florida, Minnesota, obviously all over the United States, the UK, Dubai, India, Madrid, Pakistan, and they're still coming in. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. We have a nice audience. People are probably, you know, different time zones, probably in the middle of the night, they're watching. For sure. Um, do you want to give me a question? I do. Go ahead. I do. So, uh, I think it's Chobia says, uh, experiencing excessive saliva yeah. and low stomach acid, what would you recommend? Um, a saliva bucket? No, just kidding. Um, so too much saliva and not enough hydrochloric acid. That's what we're dealing with, right? Well, I would start with the um, stomach acid. You need to be doing uh, apple cider vinegar. Um, I would do that three, I mean, every time you eat. And I would also add betaine hydrochloride to actually help uh, increase the stomach acid. The thing about this whole stomach acid thing is, um, there's, there's a lot to know about it, but the summary version is that as you age, you lose the ability to produce acid in your stomach. And there's really only one primary acid that is generated in the body, that's hydrochloric. Everything else is kind of a secondary acid. So hydrochloric acid is kind of like the um, controller of a lot of other things that happen in the body, whether it's pH, digestion, or um, um, what happens to your urine pH, for example. So when people actually measure the pH, they, they might check the saliva or the urine. They're thinking, oh yeah, I'm too acid or I'm too alkaline. But that's a, such a, a low, um, it's a kind of a secondary or downstream acid. You're not gonna really get valuable information um, because you don't really know what's happening at the stomach level. Uh, when people say, oh yeah, you're, you should be more alkaline or acid, it really depends on if it, you're talking about the blood, the saliva, the stomach, the most important thing is really getting that stomach acid corrected, and it needs to be very acid between one and three, or else everything just doesn't work that well. <laughs> Someone's okay. at the door. All right, what's the next question? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is winter. Yes. What's your best advice for recovering from a cold or a flu quickly? Um, there's a couple things you can do to increase recovery and duration especially if it's related to the flu or cold or a virus. And that would be? Intermittent fasting. Zinc. Oh. Zinc. Zinc is um, probably one of the best things. Vitamin D, that's right up there. Zinc and vitamin D, those two are just like the go-to. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, intermittent fasting would be b good as well, for sure. I mean, if you think about when you starve get sick. A, starve a cold. That's right. When you get sick, you tend to lose your appetite because your body's trying to tell you don't eat because your body just goes in this mode where it starts to repair and heal. So, but zinc is um, really good. And yeah. you can, if you have shingles, for example, you can put it topically on the wound because zinc tends to put um, viruses back in remission and shingles is a virus. Hmm. Um, shingles, um, herpes zoster, comes from chickenpox. Right, so I know it well. You do, and it, it comes out later on in life when you kind of get tired, burnt out, and stressed out. Except you know what was interesting? What's interesting? Is that I was a child when I had shingles. Inter that's very interesting, Karen. Yeah. That's very interesting. There you go. <laughs> Let's go to Mark from Queens, um, New York. You had a question, Mark. Yeah, good, good morning, Dr. Berg. Um, good morning. Thanks for all you've done, and, um, you know, especially thanks for Karen. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. thank you. Why do you say that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because you're just like a joy, and then, like, when Dr. Berg, like, kind of bears off course, you're, like, there to, like, gently guide him back on course. Yeah, well, thank you for noticing. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, I tend to kind of go off 
the deep end sometimes. You just pull me out of the woods, like, okay, let's stay on top. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's good because team. sometimes I'm um, talking over, you know, to myself, and then you're like, no, actually, the person needs to understand, right? Good. So go ahead, Mark. What was your question? Oh, my, co my cool question was, um, um, what's your, uh, your, like your seated blood pressure, your personal actual seated blood pressure? Mm-hmm. And and then I have a follow up if you'll allow me if it's if that's too easy. If it's a quick one, yes. Okay. And the follow up is um, just like how maybe the um, the the so called normal range for glucose may be actually a little high. Is it possible that what we consider normal for blood pressure may also be a little high? Oh, that's a you got some good questions. I like that. Okay, so do let's let's see what the next question is here for the next person. No, <laughs> now, um, here my I do check my blood pressure um, at least three times a week. Um, it's it's on the lower side. It's one ten over seventy five ish on average. Uh, my pulse rate's like sixty five. Um, so yes, I do believe that the numbers uh, do run high, and that leads into the next. Uh, video that I'm going to be doing that stay tuned in the next couple of days because I'm going to be talking about um, the thyroid hormone which is fascinating in relationship to this concept that you need carbs to get the thyroid because it is true that when you go on a low carb diet your active thyroid hormone T3 goes down by 40 percent but if you don't know the whole picture it could be very scary so um, Stay tuned for um, that video that's coming out. But that also relates to uh, all these other hormones, like even insulin. You know, we don't need as much insulin, especially fasting insulin level. I don't think we need as much uh, T4 or T3. So, um, and the blood pressure, I think it's on the high side, and also blood glucose. Um, you know, normal used to be like 100, or between like 80 and 100. But the point is that when you start doing keto, even that's too high comes down to 75, 70, sometimes 65, and even lower in a lot of individuals because you're not going to need um, that. You're running on glu uh, uh, ketones. You're not going to be running on glucose anymore. So the need for that goes way down. But uh, very, very good questions. Very good questions, Mark. Good job. All right, Karen. Yes. Can you give me a question? I can. An easy one. Mm, easy one. These guys are pretty, pretty good here. So. Um, Someone asks, and I'm sorry if I don't say your name because you, sometimes I don't know it's a, not a name. Anyway, someone from YouTube says fasting keeps them awake. Yeah. How can they remedy that so they can have a good night's sleep at night? Wow. I, th I thought you wanted to give me an easy one. Uh, now, what happens when you, when you do fast, um, a lot of things change hormonally. Um, they go, go for the better, and like things start becoming more efficient. Inflammation goes down. You go in healing mode. I believe that the need for sleep does go down a little bit. So it could be that your body is just not needing as much sleep. That's one theory. Um, but over time, when your body adjusts, um, you, you should actually need between 6.5 and 7.5 hours. Some people need a little bit more. But that's kind of my, my answer on that. That's I hope that's sufficient. That's your take on it. That's well, my two that's cents. That's what you have to say about and it. And I'm sticking to it. Okay, good. So uh, are pistachios okay on keto? Well, I just released a video on that. Mm. And uh, it's one of the best nuts out there um, because it's very low on oxalates. So you don't have as the risk of oxalate stones like almonds, um, other nuts do. So it's low on, it's probably one of the lowest nuts. Is it better to soak the nuts? Um, it is, but usually you're probably going to want those roasted because raw pistachios just just are not tasty at all. They're like pretty pretty terrible. Um, well, if you're going to soak them, you're going to roast them. That's what I. <laughs> that's what well, I. You can soak them, or ro <laughs> soak them or roast them, Karen. <laughs> I think <laughs> then you have to dry them out. <laughs> but the 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 point is that What's you. What's the point? You want them definitely salted, and uh, but you ever notice that pistachios are slightly green? No, not even slightly. They're green, Pistachios right? Pistachios are green. And do you know why? Uh, what else is green in nature? Ice, pistachio ice cream. Good. And what else? Grass. 
good. Trees. And vegetables. Vegetables. Right? Because of the chlorophyll. Right. So um, the chlorophyll is what you're seeing in, the, in that nut. And mm. it's, honestly, it's not really a nut. It's a seed that is in a, a fruit. But we're just going to call it a nut right now. Um, I know. That, that opens the door to just so A lot of questions. questions. But the point is that it's loaded with chlorophyll, which is really good for a lot of things, um, antioxidant. And um, it's also very high in vitamin E. Mm. Um, and so it's, it, it's full of nutrition. So, so how about the carbs? Very low, very high in fat, healthy fats, and moderate protein. I think there's a song on that. We won't song sing like on that. that right now. Uh. But I want to go to um, Olesia from Bristol, Pennsylvania. You had a question. Go ahead. Good morning, Dr. Burke. Uh, Good morning. Please just let me say thank you to everyone. Um, I can't even express gratitude and thankfulness to you guys. Just thank you for being there for us. Oh, you're welcome. Um, my quick question, um, I have SIBO. I just realized that uh, recently, and I've been on keto for a year, really strict one. And I want to stop eating veggies, increase my digest formula, and uh, maybe increase gold bladder formula. Is it safe to take eight pills of digest per meal? Is it safe to take uh, more gold bladder formula, more than one one tablet per meal? Maybe I should take those during the day just without meals because I'm doing intermittent fasting too. Okay. Good questions. SIBO, for those people that don't know what that is, that's a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And normally, you should have all your microbes, in, most of the microbes in the large intestine. But when you, they go into the small intestine, that becomes a problem because they weren't meant to be there. So they start robbing your nutrition and taking your vitamins, and you become all, uh, you get gassy. And, and the more um, fiber that you eat in the form of vegetables and the more probiotics, it worsens things. So I always recommend, you know, go on carnivore for a month or two, reset, take oregano oil, and take more uh, acidifiers, like from the Digestive Plus or Digestive Formula. So you could take a lot of that. I mean, you could probably take uh, eight or nine per meal without any problem at all. In fact, my guitar teacher uh, found that when he consumes uh, nine per meal, he can go to five guys. And I'm like, no, no, don't do that. But the point is that you do want um, more acidifiers, and that's not a problem. And you can take more gallbladder formula. Take maybe two or three after the meal. That gallbladder formula is um, quite magical because it really just, it doesn't just give you bile salts. It gives you also some betaine hydrochloride, some enzymes for the stomach, for the pancreas, and to lubricate the, the, the bile ducts. So it's uh, a real popular effective for bloating and a lot of other issues. Good question. All right, Karen, do we have a question? Sure. Yeah. Hey, so on keto, is uh, sparkling water okay? Absolutely. I recommend it. I, I, I like sparkling water. It just seems to help my digestion. It's, some, it's slightly more acidic. I mean, don't know why exactly it helps digestion, but it seems to. Um, I feel more hydrated. Um, so it's really up to your preference. But yeah, it's uh, not going to knock you out of keto at all. And I think there's a difference, right? You have sparkling water and then you have mineral water. Then so you like have sparkling a, mineral water. Because you have the club mm. soda. If you go to a restaurant and you ask for sparkling water, sometimes they'll just bring you club soda. And that's a right. different thing than like San Pellegrino. Right. Or something like that. That's correct. That's a correct statement, Karen. Well, they all those are just things that popped out of my head. <laughs> it's not like it's really <laughs> incredibly relevant. But I mean, in terms of its effect on the body, probably a little right. different. Well, Okay, good. So now that we're talking about things that are sequitur, I'm going to go right to <laughs> um, my a little commercial. This is Different our camera. new Different camera. Our new keto oh. desserts, okay? This one here is the peanut butter cup. This one is the um, pecan pie. These just became available. You can go to drbird.com under keto desserts. Um, and I just wanted to mention why um, we came up with these. Um, when you go from meal to meal and you um, want to be able to do it uh, a little faster or longer, um, we always recommend e eating a fat. Plus, we also 
recommend going low carb, desserts. You can make your own keto bombs. So this is basically a keto bomb in a dessert, or a, as a dessert, and you just scoop it out with a spoon. When How you, much would you eat? One to two tablespoons, not the whole jar, even though it's very, very tempting. Um, it does have almonds, roasted pecans, uh, organic palm oil, which I want to mention because some people are like, oh my gosh, palm oil is so bad. It's actually not good if it's, it's from fair trade and it's um, from a very good farm and it's loaded with vitamin uh, E, actually. Uh, coconut oil does not have basically any vitamins. It has essential fats, but palm oil does have vitamins. So uh, that's why I want to put that in there. It has median chain triglycerides, so it's going to build up the ketones to help your cognitive memory and function, um, natural flavors. Now, this is another point that people bring up because you, if you go to the grocery store and you see all these foods with natural flavors or flavorings, mm -hmm. a lot of times you use MSG and all sorts of chemicals. Can they call MSG natural flavoring? Yeah, they can call that natural flavoring, absolutely, because... It's it, not if, even a flavoring, if, it's a, a drug. If it's used for, an, it's, it's used as a additive, they don't have to list it as MSG. I just did a video on that. Uh, I didn't release it yet, though. Um, but n these, this natural flavoring is like the essence of the thing. Like it has, it's from natural things, herbs, uh, spices. So it gives you a much better flavor. Allulose, which is um, one of my favorite um, sugar alcohols, is a um, it's zero on the glycemic index. It doesn't seem to create hardly any digestive issues. Stevia, erythritol, and sea salt. So um, these are a little Come similar, try. but you can check it on the website. Um, they're very delicious, uh, very addicting. If you need something to go from one meal to the next, uh, you might want to check them out. Just go to drberg.com. All right, so another question for you. Yes. So, okay, vertical lines on the nails. Yes, what about it? What about it? <laughs> well, it could mean a couple things. It could be a biotin deficiency, which is a type of B, B vitamin. Mm -hmm. It could also be an iron deficiency. Mm. How do you know which is which? Well, I did a video on it. Check it out. And when you actually... That's here, so helpful. Well, here's the thing. Like, <laughs> let's say, is it biotin or is it iron? What you're going you to with? You're gonna have to know. I'll tell you in a second. Okay. <clears throat> you're going to have to know what are some other deficiencies of iron to actually understand that. Mm. Um, but I don't even recommend using a specific nutrient to fix that. I would like to recommend first do healthy keto, do, it, do the intermittent fasting before you start treating symptoms mm -hmm. because chances are you're not doing healthy keto correctly because if you were, you might not even have the ridges on the fingernails. So we always want to start there because if you go to a, a specific remedy or a trace mineral without fixing the core problem, you're treating symptoms and that's how they teach us in school but it's not the best way. Got it. Okay. Yep. All right. Did you like that answer? I loved it. Okay. I thought it was perfect. Karen, you're from Queen Creek, Arizona. You had a question. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, Dr. Berg. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I recently had a 12-millimeter kidney stone that I uh, went through two procedures to um, eliminate. And I just found out yesterday that the kidney stone was actually made with calcium. So I really want to try to avoid getting any future kidney stones. So what do you suggest I do to prevent them? Do you, um, was it calcium oxalates? Uh, you know what? She didn't tell me. I was just talking to her over the phone. I go to the doctor next Friday. But she, all she told me was that it was calcium. Yeah, it's probably calcium oxalates. So this is what I would do, Karen, if I were you. Probably. There's, th like there's like really important things, and then there's like not lesser important things. The number one thing is to understand that the calcium, the, the, um, the stone is developed because of a super saturated condition. Um, so to solve that, just increase your fluids right off the bat. So you could start doing... Um, two minimum to three liters of fluid per day. And I'm talking about adding electrolytes too, not just like plain water. So two to three um, liters a day should prevent any stones, just from that alone, okay? That's number one. Number two, you want to 
do the um, lemon juice every day because the citrates combine with the oxalates and that will counter um, that formation. Of, of course, a g the given thing is like avoid things with high end oxalates, and I have tons of videos on this. Spinach, rhubarb, almonds, kiwis. Of course, you wouldn't be on kiwi if you were um, doing my program. So, the other thing that you can do is that um, to take a little calcium when you're eating, because if there is oxalates in your food, what will happen, the cheese, whatever, during the meal, the calcium will combine with the oxalates and go through the digestive system. Won't be good, it won't be absorbed into the blood and end up in your kidney as stones. That, that's the most important thing. Um, and I would just focus on that and check out some of the videos that I've done recently on that. Thanks, Karen. All right, Karen. Okay, so a good question. Yeah, we have a bunch of questions coming in on both Facebook and YouTube about hair yeah. and hair loss. Uh, some questions are, um, will keto help reverse hair loss? And other questions are, will keto cause hair loss? What's up with the hair loss? <laughs> well, if you do dirty keto, you're going to end up with deficiencies. So I recommend something called healthy keto, mm. which you're actually eating uh, really nutrient-dense foods like the big salad, the protein, the omega-3 fatty acids, and then add in there the B vitamins with trace minerals, with uh, electrolytes. Because if you don't, when you go on keto, and which is basically just low fat, you could be ending up with, because um, you need certain nutrients more than others, so you could end up with deficiencies that could lead to the hair loss. And that's ma mainly going to be probably something of the, in the B vitamins, maybe trace minerals, because it's hard to get unless you're eating certain foods like shellfish and seafood, things like that, on a regular basis. Um, what about genetic hair loss? As far as genes go, um, people tend to, and I just did a video on this, I didn't release it yet, people think that a lot of their health problems are genetic. They're inherited. Uh, so you have to just pick your parents more wisely, right? But here's the thing. Um, only 5, maybe 10% of our health or disease things are related to genetics. Everything else is what's called epigenetics, which is above ge genetics, which basically have to do with your lifestyle, your social um, stress levels, your nutrition, um, what, you, what your mom you know, fed you growing up, what you basically ate before you were born in the womb. I mean, there's so many different factors. So what you're exposed to. Now, that's true. But with, with regard to hair loss, I mean, isn't there some, some pretty significant evidence that there's a genetic there is a genetic point to yeah, hair there, is. Loss and there is but it's not as high as you think mm -hmm. there are things you can do to counter that now especially with women there's this condition called PCOS polycystic ovarian syndrome where um, they tend to lose the hair they might get alopecia in which case they need selenium and zinc mm -hmm. um, which is another trace mineral in shellfish if you were to consume that um, but also the main thing is to lower the um, the testosterone. Um, one of the things that you, you ever notice, like, like women when they go through their si menstrual cycle, they might get acne, like around their chin, mm -hmm. right? Um, they're like, what is going on? Every month I go through this, right? Well, when you get close to your period, estrogen progesterone drops. So it's not really those two vitamins that are causing the acne. It's the androgen the testosterone that is going up in relationship to these other videos. Because even with poly polycystic ovarian syndrome, you have high levels of androgen. You get facial hair. You lose your hair up on top of your head. You get a deeper voice. Um, so that comes from high levels of insulin. So as long as you keep your insulin low, you do keto, many times that improves your hair just like that. Hmm. But then if you, if you add in the, the trace minerals and the B vitamins and the healthy version, that should take care of the hair. That was a lot yeah. of information. That Karen. was a lot. That was Crammed a lot. I, I was keeping up, though, okay, pretty much. Good. Pretty much. Good. Meanwhile, I I'm bald. And <laughs> that's another topic, but Steve. We'll get are, to uh, what thirty pounds down, and even wore socks and not shoes today. Yeah. He, things can change. The world can change. Steve is wearing socks and shoes. Okay. What about uh, skin condition? Uh, getting worse with keto and IF. What do you suspect is happening? I think they're doing too much cheese. Usually that's, that's it because that's affecting the hormones. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it could be a B vitamin deficiency because you have something called keto rash. That's a, like a B5 deficiency. Um, it could be a food allergy. Um, like, I'll give you an example. This is very rare, but when I was in practice, there was this, this one lady who started breaking out and all sorts of skin rashes and hives and, and we isolated, it was vegetables. Go figure. So she was very sensible, se sensitive to vegetables. So that, was, that never happened with anyone else but her. And she got off a lot of the vegetables and she did very well on just carnivore. So some people um, do not do well with certain things in vegetables. There are you know, lectins, which are different um, chemicals, and there's oxalates, and there's other things. But for the most part, most people can handle them fine. Fair enough. Right. Fair enough. All right. Let's go to Ashley from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Question. You have a question? I do. Hi, Dr. Berg. Hi. I'm elated to talk to you. Hey, Karen. Hi. You're both hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for informing people. I try to do the best to pass on information, but it doesn't get through so well. Um, Keep going. So my question is, in the past six months, Thank you. <laughs> in the past six months, I started keto for health reasons. Since I was already pretty lean, I just wanted to cut up and see what would happen. I'll never go back. However, I have gotten two yeast infections in that past six months. I did watch your video about ke kill candida with keto and intermittent fasting, but is there a reason that that could be related to keto? Um, you mean, oh, okay. So Here's what happens. When you actually cut down your carbs, you starve the, uh, the food for yeast. That's what you understand, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in theory, the yeast should go away. Um, but if it doesn't go away, a lot of times what happens is you get something called die-off. So you're starving the yeast and you get die-off. And so you, the die-off from yeast is sometimes very toxic. It can make you feel sick, and you can, it feels like you have a yeast infection, but it's, it's kind of just like side effects from killing off the yeast. Um, there are certain enzymes that uh, help you break it down, and uh, there's one trace mineral that's uh, a really important one, especially for the die-off of yeast. You can just get it. It's uh, malignum. Okay, I don't know if you can say that three times. Malignum. 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 Yeah. So if you get that trace mineral, I mean, you don't have to take a lot of it. Just take a, s a small amount, whatever's on the l label, and then take it for about a month. And I would also make sure to take the other trace minerals just because sometimes over time it can deplete your copper. But that's an interesting uh, trace mineral that helps to detoxify um, and clean up the byproducts of the yeast reaction. It's also good um, to detoxify like drugs out of the liver, it's also good for gout. It's also good for sulfites from different foods. So it, it'll do a lot. But that's what I would recommend. Good question. All right, Karen, I'm going to get to you, but I need to uh, go to Diane. She's been waiting patiently okay. from Laguna Beach, California. Cool. You had a question, right? Yes, I do. And I've watched over 400 of your videos. Yay. And I just thank you for all of them they've really helped me and i have been constipated for three years and so you taught me to use some potassium and um and i added that in i i've been constipated for three years i've had SIBO for eight months and i went on healthy keto about seven months ago and that's helped me a lot and i have to grind up my protein and my vegetables um, but I'm crashing all through the day from electrolytes and I have to keep taking more electrolytes. And so now that's turned into loose stool and it's like I'm not absorbing the potassium and the magnesium and I'm getting leg cramps at night and I know that my potassium and magnesium are too high because I have the loose stool, but yet I keep crashing. Okay. I know what to do. What do you recommend? I know what to do. Are you ready for this? Are you sitting down? I'm sitting down. Okay, good. <laughs> um, you need to increase 
your sea salt. Yeah. Increase the sea salt. That's what you need. Because one of the things is my electrolyte powder, I don't have it here, um, is very high in potassium, magnesium, and the other minerals, very low in sodium. So we want to increase the sodium, and that will handle the cramps like that. Um, so anytime you're on the electrolyte powder, just don't forget about the sea salt. You can put in food or just add it. But I would start increasing it a little bit more and watch the cramps go bye-bye. The other possible reason that you need a lot of electrolytes is that your, your stomach pH is not acidic enough, so you may need to add some, add some apple cider vinegar to that. And there's other reasons as well. could be something with the gut. But that's what I would do as a no-brainer. Do that this week, Diane, and call us, um, not next week, but the following week, and let us know how you do, because next week uh, we are going to be out, out of town, but the following week we'll be here. And I'm glad I just remember that. Yes. People that will be like waiting. Okay, Karen, I am ready for a question. Okay. A good one. Okay, good. And I want to let you know, there's a lot of questions and issues here, but probably 50% or more than 50% of all the comments are about people that are having good results, losing weight, resolving situations. Um, so sometimes it's kind of hard to find a, an a issue problem. that you haven't yeah. talked about. So, I mean, there's some of them are, are real common. But and, and the questions always relate to a friend. Someone has a friend with, <laughs> um, you know, I have a friend yeah. who has, right. So here's a, a person made a comment. They have a variety of things. Muscle pain, knee popping, digestion issues on keto. So I'm assuming they're saying since they got on to keto, they've experienced some of these things. I don't know what kind of keto, but they say keto. So we got knee popping, muscle, muscle aches, pain. muscle pain. Okay. Okay, and digestion issues. Digestion issues. Okay. Well, the muscle pain could be either um, low vitamin D or low vitamin E. Okay, or they're not doing intermittent fasting long enough. The popping is the low B1, and then you said achiness, right? Muscle pain. Muscle pain. It's low vitamin D. It's low vitamin D. So there you have here's, it. here's the thing, guys. It's, it's <laughs> virtually impossible to get your vitamin D from your food. And it's virtually impossible to get your vitamin D in January out in the sun. That's why you need to go somewhere sunny in January. Yeah, but the point is that um, during the win winter months, you need to actually be taking uh, vitamin D with K2 because it is so powerful. It is one of the most, actually I think it's the most important vitamin, which is not even vitamin, it's a hormone, but it's actually good to protect your immune system, uh, especially against viruses. So don't forget about vitamin D. Right. Reminds me, I have to take my vitamin D today. Doc, is that D3? Is that Yes, D3, that's correct, okay. Steve. Not D2. Is there a D2? Yes, there is. Ah. Let's go to Helen from Jackson, Mississippi. Kay. You had a question? Yes, hi, Dr. Burke. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, I just want to say I thank you for the good work that you do for us all. I do have a question. So I have been on a keto diet for, let's say, two months now, and I have been seeing great results thanks to you. And last week I was diagnosed with H. pylori. Mm -hmm. So at this point, my question is, will I be putting myself into danger if I start taking the antibiotics? Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen a physician yet, um, but these are just the questions that are bothering me. and. Um, what would be a proper or best natural treatment to H. pylori? And would you advise me to stop the keto diet and focus on treating the H. pylori at this point? I am just very confused, Dr. Berg. And also, what meals can I be eating at this point? Um, so, yeah, so I would I, be very grateful if you can help me. Sure, Javi, I just have a question for you. Um, do you have stomach pains or stomach heartburn or any digestive problems right now? At this, right now I have stomach bloating. Okay. I do not okay. feel any pain. Okay. Um, yeah, it's okay. just my, yeah, I just feel bloated okay, so all the time. Here's my, here's my um, answer. Um, I can't tell you not to take your medication. 
I can't tell you that. So all I can do is tell you to research certain things. And I would watch my videos on H. pylori and you can get more data. But the, the first thing that I would highly recommend, whether you get treated or not, is to not change keto or intermittent fasting because you don't want to go back to more carbs. Um, that would not make sense. Secondly, you want to increase the acidity of your stomach because there's a big connection between the pH of your stomach and that microbe. Huge. And you'll be able to show you that when you watch the video. You need more acid, betaine hydrochloride, apple cider vinegar in the stomach to help yourself. That's what I would do if I were you. Thanks, Helen. All right, Karen. Okay, so we have a request for you to advise what should kids eat? Um, well, kids should do the same program, but if they're very small kids, um, I don't recommend intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. but I don't recommend a lot of snacks either. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, think about nowadays. I mean, these kids are just giving every, every hour, like, here, give them some food, give them some food. Like, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think we should do three, three meals with, um, you know, per day for kids, and they would do fine. But they do still want to do low carb. Uh, they can get, a, get by with more carbs for sure. Maybe they go up to 70 grams a day or even 80 grams a day. Uh, maybe a little bit of sweet potato. Maybe a little bit of brown rice if you want to. But um, I wouldn't start going with the grains. I did a video on this, Karen. It's more in depth. That's why I'm, I don't want to spend too brief? much time on that right. question. But and, and there are a lot of questions here. What would you say to people who aren't getting their questions answered here. I wish I had more videos to give you guys. Um, actually, I do. <gasps> I do. They're on YouTube. I have, <laughs> um, you know, I just want to let you guys, if you're new, I want to say that sometimes it might be hard to find them, and I'm, we're working on that, a better index. But I have videos on every single question you guys are asking. I'm serious. I have questions on every single, because here's the thing. When I try to come up with, um, new videos. I'll go right to my YouTube and I'm like, oh my gosh, I did a, two videos on that already. So um, it's not easy to find new content, um, but I'm doing it. But the point is that we have so many videos on every single topic you are asking. Every so if you feel like we're not answering your question, just go to YouTube and search it. And, and he'll answer your question. Yeah. Right. If you go to YouTube and write Dr. Berg <coughs> and then whatever your question is, ridges on fingernails, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, any, anything. I mean, other than the, the lab result questions, you know. Uh, yeah. But it's all yeah. there. And I'm, I'm, I already have this. I just have to make this link more available. I think what I'll do is I'll put it on my website as a big, bold button. Um, of to, it's a document. I already have this done. It's one document that just lists all the videos that I've ever done on YouTube. And you just need to just go down the document so that way it won't get lost in YouTube land. You can just go down the document, there's the video I need, and it just pops up the video. So that is something. Is it, is it categorized or is it yeah, just? Yeah, it's organized. We spent a long time doing it. And, um, well, fact, I think that that's good. You should have that. I need to put that on the website. Put that so on the website. Go to the website Coming soon. very soon. Stay tuned, drberg.com. Also on drberg.com, for everybody who is new, there are videos that tell you exactly how to get started. New to keto? Watch these three videos on exactly how to get started. It's the first video in the blog, step one. Yeah. And I got step two and step three. It's like right across the top. Yeah. Make it super simple. Super simple. I have a question here. Oh, yeah. and somebody brought up a good point. I don't yeah. know if this is the point they were bringing up. They're just like January? Because you said uh, vitamin D in January. But that's just the United States, right? Yeah. Or North America. Right. Because in Australia, yeah. it's right. summer in good January. Good point, Karen. That's a really good point. I, I didn't think of that until now you just brought that up. Yeah. So depending on where you live, your the January. The month that has the least sun or that yeah. you're out in the sun the, the least. The dead of winter. Right. Winter is coming in the U.S. And winter it's going to be a cold coming. one. It is going to be, be a, a cold long one. winter. Yeah. The longest winter. Yeah. Okay. Good point, Karen. Now, would you recommend intermittent fasting for dogs? Highly recommend it. <laughs> Charlie's um, on I, on, IF. Honestly, if I had it my way, I would feed our dog one meal a day. That's just my opinion. Um, he doesn't get to do that. 
but he eats twice a day. But I mean, look, here's another, another answer to that question. Look at dogs that eat all day long. I mean, you, you do all have... All the treats, right? All the snacks. All the treats, oh all the gosh, snacks. Oh my gosh, it's so bad. Or people who are being mounds and mounds. I mean, with our last dog, Trixie, we, I would give her food one time a day and she would nibble on it throughout the day. She never overate. I mean, I don't think all dogs are like that. Like, yeah, I'm not But sure. if you're feeding, like Charlie won't eat his whole bowl if he's not into it. But if you kept feeding him all day long, he'd keep eating and keep eating at it. Look at dogs that eat all day like that. I know. Look at look at animals that are. That's the same with people. <sighs> I hear you, Karen. You I hear really me? Hear. I are hear you it. picking up what I'm throwing? Yes, down. I am, Karen. Are you catching what I'm tossing? Uh, no, but I want to go to Joshua okay. right now. He's been waiting patiently from Thanks, Pasture Valley, California. Go ahead. You had a question. I'm hot. Okay. I'm Hi. Gout. And oh. hi. Um, well, I have um, gout, and I am on the um, what I just called um, intermittent fasting class. Okay. Um, my question is, um, I am really, really losing weight. Um, I am uh, about one hundred and ninety-eight pounds. Okay. Less. Uh, so I want to know the other doctor's appointment uh, on October 24th. And I want to know that if I keep on going to pay, that I get my um, my weight down. Yeah. Uh, so you you weigh you weigh 98 today. pounds, Joshua? No, I lost. Not much. Oh, you lost. Okay. And do you want any? Do you want to lose any yeah. more weight? Yes, I do. Okay. So let me just uh, give you that answer right now because uh, it's a little bit difficult to hear you. Um, the more weight you want to lose, the less frequent you want to eat. One meal a day would be great. But I do understand when you actually do more intermittent fasting, guess what? Uric acid goes up. Why? Because it's an antioxidant. But it's only an antioxidant in your blood. It's a pro-oxidant inside the cells, which means if it gets in your big toe, it can hurt and get in the knee and hurt. So with gout, um, there's a simple thing to do, um, and then there's some a kind of a correction to do. Um, if, you, if you just slightly alkalize the body uh, with either potassium citrate or lemon juice, now you're probably saying, wait a second, I thought lemon juice was acidic. It is, but as soon as it breaks down your body, it turns alkaline, and so it will make uh, it can give people a lot of relief because it counters the acidic nature of the, um, of the uric acid. So that should put that thing in remission. The problem is if you have osteoarthritis, you don't want to do lemon juice because that can flare it up. So I will do a video on that just to clarify that. But, but I, for you, you need to do a lot of lemon juice and probably potassium citrate and do one meal a day um, to actually counter this gout because it's, you know, gout really comes from um, it's, it's really kind of a, a, a kidney problem because the, the body's, the kidney is not eliminating it, so it could be past damage from the kidney. It could be high fructose corn syrup, it could be certain organ meats, but it could be chocolate, uh, things like that. But typically it's the inability of you to get rid of uh, um, uric acid because the kidney is not doing like it should. There's a couple things that you could take to help yourself. One is malignum. Another is zinc, uh, but I would definitely uh, start chowing down and drinking down that uh, lemon juice um, like probably a cup a day, and then keep your, um, your body slightly alkaline. All right, good question. Karen. Yeah, here's an interesting question. Uh, I think it's uh, Nanya. Yeah. Oh, Nanya business. <laughs> This is why I don't tell people's names. That's why yeah, some dude on YouTube says, you know, none your business. I kind of like that, though. But anyway, uh, I, mean, I would like to answer this question, but it's none your business. No, I'll ask the question anyway. What happens to the fat cell when you gain and lose weight? Do you know? Well, it expands and contracts, Karen. But it um, does, is it more susceptible to accumulating mass, or is it just this thing that expands and contracts? Is there... 
Well, I'm sure damage. I'm sure you would agree that uh, it's very, very easy to lose weight and it's hard to gain weight, right? Like, why are pe why do people gain weight so easily, but it's so hard to lose it? Mm -hmm. That's the real question. Okay. Well, does that have anything to do with the cell itself? I guess would be the answer to none yes. business. Yes, it does. It does. Um, the cell has a goal of surviving, so it doesn't like to lose anything. It likes to hold on to stuff um, because it's th uh, the survival is threatened when you actually lose weight. So. And in the more um, fat that you burn, or the least amount of fat you burn, is related just to really one thing, mm. and that is like how much insulin resistance you have. If you have, if your insulin is good and you don't have a history of creating insulin resistance and your blood sugars are great, you can oxidize or break down fat really easy. But if you have insulin resistance, it's going to be more difficult. Um, it does take time to fix insulin resistance, sometimes up to two or three years. Um, but as far as the fat cell, that's where the insulin resistance is located many times in the fat cell. Hmm. So that's what we're dealing with is uh, the history of how many times you, you know, ate carbs and then also the history of how many times you dieted. Extreme could, fat, extreme weight loss yeah. types of solutions. Yeah, and unhealthy type. Um, but even then, if you do keto and intermittent fasting and you go for the goal of fixing in insulin resistance, you will eventually um, reestablish a good metabolism, um, which that's in a video coming up, Karen. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh -huh. and none of your business. Be nice now. I just took your question. Okay. Now, um, I had a, another question here, but I got distracted by this caller. So okay, I'll tell you what. You, you take you a question and I'll come back up with my... Edwin, you're from uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You had a question about hypoglycemia. Go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning, Dr. Berg and Karen. Uh, it's an honor to talk to you both. Good morning. Um, so I have a question regarding the, um, um, th this condition. Uh, I'm not sure if, if I really had it. I started being in keto and intermittent fasting after this happened about a year ago in December. Um, basically, after taking some Theraflu, uh, you know, the, the nighttime severe cold type of uh, medicine, I got this really bad panic attack mm -hmm. out of nowhere. Just I took it a few uh, half an hour later. I was about to fall asleep and had a panic attack. Mm -hmm. uh, it went away. A week later, exactly the same, another panic attack happened. All, also around the time that I was like either falling asleep or halfway asleep, mm. and and it came and then it went away. Okay. Then exactly a week later, the same thing happened, and but this time the third one was the worst because my body ever since that third uh, panic attack stayed with a uh, tension headache. So I have ten mm. tension headaches. Uh, tightness in my head ever since then that hasn't gone away mm. and that's one of the reasons I started listening to you I got myself in keto and IF and um, I've improved but um, I'm trying to figure out if before I started doing the keto and IF could I have had some sort of um, uh, problem with my adrenals or hypoglycemia that when I took this medicine it just turned like a switch that got me into some anxious mode that yeah. I, I can't really get, get out of. Okay, so this is what I would do, Edwin. Um, I would just um, take that product, separate all the ingredients, do research on every single ingredient, just for the, for the viewpoint of the side effects from those ingredients to see if that would be one of them, and also to see what nutrients they deplete. Um, that would be what I would do, and chances are it's going to be probably depleting B1 mm. is going to be the big one, uh, if you were to take um, vitamin B1 and some good amount of nutritional yeast, um, that usually helps panic attacks greatly. Uh, but it sounds like it did something to the adrenals. I don't know if it's hypoglycemia, but I do understand that there, who knows what's in some of the medications. I mean, I remember a long time ago, I had a job that I had to work third shift uh, um, at a newspaper facility. I was uh, stuffing newspapers, whatever. And uh, I remember um, being so tired, I was taking, I had to sleep real fast, and then I had to wake up. So I took a similar thing, some nighttime 
it was pure sugar. And you just wake up feeling so groggy and tired. So I don't, I know there's some stuff in there that's not that great. But that's what I would do. Uh, B1 is what you need to do, Edwin. Thanks for your call. All right. You ready for another question? Or do you want me to go to another question? Go to um, Go one more Darryl. and then I got it. Okay. Daryl, you're from North Carolina and you had a question. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I've, I've gotten to a point I've lost almost 60 pounds since 2016. Awesome. But starting September 1st, I did the keto and I went from 340 down to 313. Good job. Wow. And I'm starting to get... Thank you. I'm, I'm starting to plateau, and I was trying to figure out, should I go to OMAD, and should that be for morning or lunch? Got it. Good question. All right, Daryl, I think you definitely need to do OMAD. If, if you're finding that you're over the age of 25, getting older, um, I'm being sarcastic, and... Uh, you have a, a weight, enough weight to lose, you need to be doing OMAD for sure. Make sure it's uh, the healthy version. Uh, as far as the timing goes, I would play it by ear. Um, I would recommend probably later in the day, like let's say you ate around six or f between four and maybe even seven, I think that would be best. When, you, when your system is kind of towards the nighttime, later in the day, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest, kicks in, and you'll have a little better digestion. So that's what I would do. But, but you could also do it earlier. Go with how, where, whenever you're hungry. I do have people that are doing what's called one meal every other day, which is extensive. Is there an abbreviation for that? I'm going to make one. <laughs> but the point is that they, uh, they need that extra help with more fasting, and they, do, they thrive on that. Omeo. So... You might want to even look at that at some point if you want to lose some faster weight. But it all depends on where your metabolism is. But just make sure that you're doing it uh, with enough nutrients as well. Um, and one last thing, Daryl, I wanted to mention, then I'm going to zip it.com. Um, when you're fasting, it's you are eating, okay? Your cells are eating your own fat. It's not that you're not being well nourished. You are being well nourished because you're eating your own fat, your reserves. So people, people don't like to start intermittent fasting because they think, oh my, I'm not going to eat. No, no, you are eating. It takes like three days to convert, but you're eating when you're not eating. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Daryl, thanks for your question. And now we're going to go to Karen. Okay, good. Here's my favorite question of the day. How can I get a flat stomach? If I who knew that, would I be sitting here right now? Who doesn't want a flat stomach? You have a flat stomach. Okay, this is what you do. You get an iron. No. <laughs> you um, do a lot of sit-ups. No. It's, it's just your stomach is a reflection of insulin resistance and um, how much insulin is going on in your body. So it's very simple. Don't focus on your stomach. Focus on um, lowering your insulin. How do you do that? Well, watch my videos. You, you want to cut oh, yeah. the carbs Beautiful. down as low as possible. There's actually a really cool program. It's actually on, I think it's on the website, but don't quote me, but I know it's on YouTube. It's called Keto on Steroids. Yeah. And that is an extreme version of keto. And you can watch that video. And uh, if you did that video over a period of time, you will get a flat stomach. And I promise. And I will give you a guarantee as well. <laughs> or your money back. Or your money back. Oh, that's right. It's free. But that's also for anybody who's asking these plateau questions. There's a lot of videos on plateau, but that's a great one. And, and we hear great feedback from people who've been plateaued um, doing that uh, extreme keto. Keto um, on steroids. Keto on steroids. Uh, it is extreme. It's extreme. But it, you know what? If, you're, if you want to get results, who cares if it's extremely hard? Who cares? <laughs> and by the way, nobody said it was going to be easy, right? Except this lady that did a video on how she lost hundreds of pounds and turned her entire life around. She's like, this is the easiest thing I've ever done. It really is. We promoted that video last week. I forget what it is, so don't ask me now. But um, she's a success story uh, video. 
I think the hard thing is just the transition part. Once, I mean, like kind of getting used to it. But once you're into it, the food is great. All food you guys that are on, you know, it's it's like you're not starving, you're not hungry. And the other thing is, I, I think what people come up with a lot is just the social thing. Like I, I had that for a while where, oh, you know, I can't have dinner with my family or I can't go to lunch with so and so, and that's just baloney because you just change your that's schedule. Right. Or you know that's what? Right, Karen. Most of the time, I'm, I'm uh, I try to go for eating one time a day. Sometimes I eat twice a day. Yeah. Big right. deal. I bet you there's been days where I've eaten three times what? a day. What? You didn't tell me about that. It can happen. But okay. you know, it's keto. It's good food. You know, so you have to w do it on a gradient. You have to work it into your life. And I was going to say, where's the book? So for people who are new or for people who still have questions, Oh, this is a great, this is the Cliff Notes. This is the Cliff Notes, this one, put that one down. The Cliff Notes <laughs> for getting into keto and intermittent fasting. Where if, do you get this? If, this you go, if you go to the site, drburg.com, you get this one and this one oh, together. Oh, this one's free if yeah. you get the hard. Or you can buy them is, separately. And this on is the text here. Right, right. This is the text. So anybody who's doing this, if you have questions, you should absolutely read the book because that's the whole purpose it was written, and, and then you'll have a lot of your answers, too. Can I say one last thing before mm, we go, Karen? Vote. Anyone? Anyone? Here, here's the thing. Okay. Um, first of all, I buy a lot of books. Yes, you do. And um, the problem with books is that they don't have a lot of pictures. This has 148 pictures. This, by the way, is look at this. almost all pictures. Look at this. Oh. These are all pictures, anyway. okay? Look at this. Pictures, pictures, <laughs> pictures, right? Okay, that's one. Especially when we're reading health books. It's like you don't want this like completely dry book with no pictures. I Number two, it, yeah. the font, okay, is big enough where you can read without glasses. Three, I don't give you a lot of fluff. I hate with a passion reading books. I mean, I'm looking for the good stuff, right? The vital stuff. I can't find it. It's way it's like it's on page three hundred and thirty five. I yeah. have to spend all this time to extract it. I'm not gonna give you that. It's like get to the point, tell me what I need to know that's gonna help me. And let me move on because I know that, I mean, we're busy. Um, I'm busy. You're busy. You're busy. You're so juggling a million things and starting a new way of eating. And you don't need to know the history of, of every ancient culture that ever ate. Now, if you want that, get that book. But So the point is the books that, um, that I'm rec we're recommending are easy to read. They get to the point, have a lot of health information. There's pictures and there's no fluff. On that note, Fluff we won't free. see you next week, yes. but we'll see you the following week. So Have do a well wonderful weekend. On your week, on your own, watch a lot of videos, and um, we'll see you in two weeks.